SeaWorld Orlando is part of the grand slam of Floridian theme parks, being joined by the likes of Universal Orlando, Disney World, and SeaWorld's sister park, Busch Gardens Tampa. But unlike the other parks mentioned, SeaWorld has always come off as the black sheep of the Florida theme parks. Maybe it's because of the lack of attractions within the park. Maybe it's because of their continual use of animal acrobatic shows in order to entice guests into their park. Either way, they still attract millions of guests through their turnstiles every year. But with the park's problematic nature, it's found itself becoming the backmarker to many of Florida's other theme park offerings. And with a park as fascinating as SeaWorld, this is quite a shame. So today, I wanted to take you through each land in the park and tell you what I would do to make the park better than what it currently is today. My name is Smooth, and this is Making SeaWorld Orlando Better. And before I tell you about my solutions, we first gotta go over the problems. So let's look at the ride lineup in this park. We got six roller coasters, a river raft ride, a bunch of kiddie rides, some Disney-fied displays of animal cruelty, and uh, oh, well, wait, that, that's it? What, what do you mean that's it? Wait, the only other two non-coaster offerings are upcharges? Who the fuck's gonna pay six bucks to go on a sky tower? As you can see, the biggest problem with this park, outside of their capitalistic cruelty, is a ride lineup that isn't very fleshed out. And don't get me wrong, roller coasters are awesome. But when your park is just roller coasters, it leaves a lot left to be desired. And this is what puts all the other parks in Florida a step above. Their mix of coasters, flat rides, dark rides, and water rides to bring their guests a full experience. I mean, hell, you got Islands of Adventure right down the street, and I consider that park one of the most complete parks in the world. So the most important thing to focus on when plussing this park is expanding their ride lineup. Now, where do you get the space for all these new rides? Well, if it isn't obvious by now, these animal shows have got to go. Animals aren't put on this planet to be paraded like props. They're meant to live and share this planet with us. And when a park promotes conservation and preservation, and then have dolphins do a bunch of flippy doos for an audience, the message now becomes more about capitalism and consumerism. On my last visit to SeaWorld, I attempted watching one of these shows, and after 10 minutes I had enough. It just didn't sit right with me. So what do we do with all these animals that are currently in possession by SeaWorld? Well, right across the street, you got Discovery Cove, an animal park where you can get up close and personal with sharks and dolphins. Now, what I'm suggesting is we change the motif of this park, turning this park into a conservation and research hub of the SeaWorld Orlando Resort. Move all the animal exhibits to this park and use all this expansion space to give them bigger pools and more areas to swim. Also offer tours through newly built research facilities to teach guests the importance of saving animals and getting them prepared to be returned to the wild. SeaWorld themselves actually have an initiative called SeaWorld Rescue, which touts to have saved over 40,000 marine animals up to now. And with a concept like this, they can further prove to the public their dedication to this cause and message, and maybe repair all the damage done by films such as Blackfish. But most importantly of all, now we got a ton of space to build some new rides, so let's get to the theme park. <laughs> Every park experience starts by walking through the entrance. No fucking shit. And SeaWorld's entrance is tumultuous to say the least. Unlike other parks, where the entrance is easy to get through and for the most part uncluttered, SeaWorld's is a jumbled mess. At the moment, everyone is funneled to either side of this massive ticket booth before being packed in like sardines in a tight little barely themed area. Compare this to the beautiful front entrance of SeaWorld San Diego and the absolute god tier entrance of SeaWorld San Antonio, you realize that Orlando's entrance is mid at best. What's funny is how simple the solution really is. Alright, ready for this? You take the ticket booth and you move it to the right. Wow, look at all that space we just made. Now you got all the space in the world to funnel people into the park, hopefully shortening the amount of time it takes to get in. Add a cool mosaic on the floor and ocean themed shade canopies above and all of a sudden you got a much better entrance experience. Now entering the park is 0.00001% of the experience. Let's get into the park itself. Before I continue, I gotta say, these current land names are garbage. Sea of Delight? Okay, sure. Sea of Mystery? I mean, yeah, I guess that's a cool name. 
Sea of Shallows? What the fuck is a shallow? So I will be renaming each land in order to help flesh out the themes of each land better. We start with the entrance land to the park, Old Key West. Now I love this as an entrance land to the park. It brings in architecture that is very Floridian, and has a vibe that is unique to this park. There really isn't much I would do with this land. Well, besides get rid of this pointless wall over here. But the only thing I would add to this land involves this spot currently occupied by the baby dolphin pool. That change would be one of four stations for something this park desperately needs. A monorail. Now one of the most annoying things during my last visit to this park was the sheer amount of walking I had to do to get from one ride to another. Like if I wanted to go from Icebreaker to Kraken, I'd have to give up 15 minutes of my time walking around two lakes to get there. And it really doesn't help when Florida decides to be Florida, and you got one half of the park raining and the other half of the park is sunny side up. A monorail would alleviate all of these issues. I would build stations at the front where the dolphin nursery is, one over where Wild Arctic currently stands, one where Shark Wreck Reef is, and one where Turtle Trek currently stands. I'm of the opinion that every park could benefit from a mode of transportation, and this park is number two on that list for me, because we all know number one is Marine Land. And don't worry, one of these days I'll give you my thoughts on that barren wasteland of a park. But for now, let's continue on to the first new land of my reimagined sea world. So I love the aesthetic introduced by Manta. The cool rock work and waterfalls is gorgeous. And I wanted to take this theming and expand it into the rest of the land. This land will wrap around the plot of land currently used by the Dolphin Theater. Now besides the Dolphin Theater and Manta, there really isn't much going on in this area. Unless you want to go spend a couple minutes pissing off a bunch of stingrays. High five dude. <laughs> you too, bro. Oh, Jesus, whoa. So you bet I'm about to load this land with rides that will bring this area of the park back to life. Now, I want to make this park the coaster capital of Orlando. And for that, we need a marquee coaster. Something that gives insane ejector airtime and spine-tingling thrills. And with the removal of the Stingray Lagoon and the Dolphin Cove, we now got a nice plot of land for a proper e-ticket roller coaster. Now, the obvious choice for this plot of land is a Mac Extreme spinning coaster, and frankly, I can't bet against that idea. At first, I didn't really feel these coasters, as I was kind of unimpressed with the footage I saw of Time Traveler at Silver Dollar City. It wasn't until I saw a video of Taylor and Sarah riding Ride to Happiness at Plopsaland upon that my whole view of these types of coasters changed forever. Alright, here we go. Whoa! Oh my god! Whoa! So this coaster, which I call Tidal Twister, will feature an insane layout that'll blow any other spinning coaster out of the water. No pun intended. After walking by whirlpools and tide pools in the queue line, you enter your turtle-shaped ride vehicle and head out of the station. You make a left and hit the launch, accelerating into a large top hat. I could imagine riding through an Intamin-style top hat in a spinning car would be out of this world. After that, a small bunny hop brings you into the second element of this ride, a flying snake dive similar to what is found on Ride of Happiness. Afterwards, you go through an elongated zero-g stall, spinning while hanging upside down. Afterwards, you shoot up to the left and get popped out of your seat as you're yanked back down to the ground. Then a massive wave turn follows before you hit the final inversion of the coaster, a step-up underflip, kind of like what you would find on Wildcat's Revenge. Riders then twist and turn through a couple dips and helixes, avoiding waterfalls and whirlpools before finally reaching the brake run. The one thing lacking in this park is a true marquee roller coaster. You look at other Floridian parks and they have that must-do coaster. Like Bush Gardens with Iron Guazi, or Islands of Adventure with Velocicoaster, or Peppa Pig's theme park with Daddy Pig's roller coaster. 
I mean, I guess you could consider Mako a marquee coaster, but I mean, calling a B&M Hyper a marquee roller coaster is like calling a McDonald's a marquee restaurant. There's just so many of them. I, I, cannot, I can't believe I just compared B&M Hypers to McDonald's. This is that bucket list coaster that will make SeaWorld a must-stop destination for both coaster enthusiasts and the more general theme park goers out there. But that's not all that's being added to this land. No, no, no. We are far from over. Up next, we got our first flat ride addition to this park. Built where the SeaWorld Rescue Shop currently stands will be a jump to called Raging Octopus. But smooth, aren't Hus Jump 2's unreliable pieces of crap? Well, okay, yeah, they're, they're pretty much break down all the time. But no, they are not pieces of crap. I've had the pleasure of riding Sledgehammer back at my old home park, Canada's Wonderland. And though it was closed half the time I went, when it was open, it was my favorite flat ride in the park. Like, imagine a drop tower mixed with those tornado rides you find at your local county fair. And that's essentially what this ride is. Very exciting and engaging from start to finish. And seeing that this ride type is still listed on Huss's website, I am of the belief that these are still being manufactured, despite the fact that only one exists. I could only hope that by now they would have figured out the kinks to this ride. Imagine a giant angry looking octopus throwing riders into the air, and you essentially get what I'm going for here. Across the way will be a new splash pad called Geyser Splash. This is a fun area for the whole family to play in, with fountains and waterfalls begging to be interacted with. I imagine something very similar to Moana Journey of Water at Epcot, but unlike that attraction, this will have the goal of getting you soaked. Surrounding this attraction will be part of the land's third coaster and the second coaster I will be introducing to this park, Dolphin Dash. Now, I've noticed that as of recently, especially here in America, the new coaster trend seems to be the coma family boomerangs. In 2024 alone, we're getting new ones built in Holiday World and Kings Island, and I feel this park could be the perfect home for one of these coasters. The ride will start at the north end of the old Dolphin Theater plot of land. After hitting the top of the lift, the ride flies through the station, swooping right and heading down along a new lake. After a quick bunny hop, the coaster hits a long left and jumps over Geyser Splash, avoiding geysers and people below trying to spray riders. After another long left, the ride hits a couple bunny hills before climbing a spike and traversing the layout again, but in reverse. This will be a fun family coaster that'll get younger visitors prepared for the bigger thrills that the park has to offer. Finally, we got the first dark ride addition for this park. Built where Turtle Trek and the Manatee exhibit currently sits will be SeaWorld Rescue the Ride. This will be a multimedia dark ride similar to rides like The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man or Jurassic World Adventure. On this ride, you'll be riding in a speedboat rushing through stormy conditions trying to stop a group of poachers from hoarding a pot of manatees. Now, I, I know the irony of a storyline like this, but just work with me here, okay? After successfully completing the mission, riders are let out into the SeaWorld Rescue Research Center, an interactive area with exhibits that teach guests about the things they can do to help protect marine life, as well as show off all the things SeaWorld Rescue has done in their efforts to preserve marine wildlife. The SeaWorld Rescue Shop will also be relocated to this new building. With five new additions to the park, Shallow Springs will become a must-stop destination for guests when visiting the park. And with all that, you're probably wondering, What's that lake you mentioned earlier? Up next, we got the Isle of Legends, home to two SeaWorld staples, Kraken and Journey to Atlantis, as well as our next new addition, Splash Bucklers. Now, when we talk about Florida legends, nothing fits that bill more than the stories of pirates and buccaneers. With a rich history of it in this state, it's only fitting we pay tribute to that in this land. And I figure there's no better way to do that than with a splash battle. Because no other park has ever thought of doing a pirate themed splash battle before. Like, I mean, no other park. Like, it's, it's just, it's never happened. So this will take up the vast majority of the land left over by the Dolphin Theater. There will be crashed ships that the boats ride through and treasure along the ride path, as well as many opportunities for riders to battle guests on passing ships. As well, there will be cannons along the outside of the attraction for bystanders to shoot at people on board, making them even more soaked than they already are. 
this is a fun attraction that doesn't need to be too deep or rich in storytelling. That's the job of its neighboring attraction, Journey to Atlantis. Oh! <laughs> Shit. Now this ride has a bit of an identity crisis. When it first opened, it was one of the most highly themed attractions in all of Orlando, taking riders down into Atlantis where a siren tries to lure them in before transforming into Jada Pinkett Smith and trying to Hulk smash them. Now the ride's like, here's Atlantis, okay bye! It's literally half the ride it used to be. So obviously the fix here is to bring back the storyline of this attraction but do it with all the modern advancements the 2020s have given us. After a new Q video that explains how a boat company is now giving tours of the recently discovered remains of Atlantis, riders board a boat with unique golden seahorses attached to the front of it. Riders then enter a dark tunnel where the seahorse glows, and a water tunnel forms in front of riders for them to go through. And, and yes, this is literally the same effect from Poseidon's Fury. But with that attraction closed now, SeaWorld might as well go ahead and steal it. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong, right? FBI, open up! After this, riders enter a redone underwater scene with video projections of fish and mermaids swimming around them, and a giant humpback whale that swims overhead. Once you enter Atlantis, the siren, just like before, lures you in before revealing herself to be the evil Medusa. She tries to turn riders to stone, but fails to attack the boat. As you rise up the lift, you see the remains of Atlantis break around you, and a giant figure of Medusa lunges at you before you disengage the lift and enter outside. The ride pretty much continues as normal until you re-enter the building. Medusa, appearing to swim around riders, tries one final time to turn them to stone, but at the last second, the golden seahorse at the front of the boat shoots her with a laser beam, and riders plummet into the final splashdown, escaping Medusa and making it back to land. A retheme of this iconic ride is what is sorely needed to breathe new life back into it. But it's not the only ride in this land that'll be getting a massive upgrade. The last ride we need to talk about in this area is the Almighty Kraken. SeaWorld's first mega coaster, thrilling riders since 2000, and god dang does this ride feel like it's over 20 years old. As fun as this coaster is, it vibrates so much. Like. It literally vibrates to the point where you feel your eyeballs shake within your skull. But with that being said, the ride still offers an incredible layout and awesome forces. So getting rid of this ride outright is not really an option. But instead, why don't we do what Islands of Adventure did with the Incredible Hulk back in 2015? Retract the entire coaster and upgrade the queue experience. Now at the moment, Kraken is probably one of the worst queues in the whole park. Like, there is no theming in sight. And the one theming element they had outside the ride is now just a random rock formation with nothing inside. So let's take some inspiration from some other coasters and make something special. Now instead of entering a monorail station, riders will enter the Kraken's lair, walking through dark caves with research equipment scattered throughout. Radios are placed throughout the queue telling riders about explorers who entered the Kraken's lair, only escaping by the skin of their teeth, recalling the horrors they experienced while within. Riders then enter the station, which glows red, and there are windows where you see a giant squid swimming outside, with its tentacles floating by the windows from time to time. This will be very similar to the station from Leviathan at SeaWorld Australia, serving as a sort of pre-show to the main attraction. The ride itself is pretty much exactly the same as the original, except now the track is painted red instead of blue. Once over, riders are let out into the same courtyard from before, but now in the rock formation is a giant tank with squids that swim over guest heads. With these changes, Isle of Legends will become a much more story-driven land, and this level of theming and storytelling will carry over into the next land we will talk about. <laughs> Now, as of the writing of this video, we are still waiting on an announcement for the park's new family B&M coaster, currently codenamed Project Toboggan. And honestly, who would have ever thought we'd see a launched family B&M coaster, especially one in the US, and especially at a park that just built a launched B&M coaster the year prior. I'm very excited to see what this project is truly all about, but I will say that this is definitely a step in the right direction for the park, 
giving them that family coaster that is missing from their lineup. Hey y'all, uh, Smooth from the Future here. And uh, go figure that as I'm editing this video, SeaWorld decides to announce Penguin Trek. You know, what's funny is I had a feeling this was gonna happen. Like, I, I was recording, like, the voiceover for the Antarctica section, and I was like, oh, watch, they're totally gonna announce the coaster while I'm editing. And, uh, well, well here we are. So, um, I figure I might as well go ahead and give you my thoughts on this. And uh, this, this section is gonna be totally unscripted. I'm, I'm not in the mood to, like, type up another paragraph or two right now. So, um, yeah, I, I like this. This is really awesome. Exactly, like, the step in the right direction for this park. I love that they're adding a new family launch coaster. Who would have thought it would have been a B&M? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's insane to me. B&M family coaster. You know, I love this new direction B&M's going in. You know, like, going totally off kilter and off brand to what they're known for. You know, first we had Pipeline, and now we got Penguin Trek. And not to mention things like that, like, B&M wing shuttle coaster they did in England. So, uh, I'm a big fan of this. I also, I also love the theming that they're putting in this ride, you know, like, this whole sea station, Antarctica thing they're going for, like, with all the ice and stuff, you know, I love how there's this pre-section to the coaster where you're going through the snow and you're seeing penguins and all this, really awesome stuff. Now, uh, one thing I found weird is, um, if you look at the, like, art for, like, the station, you'll notice the train, there's only, like, one car on the train, and yet they have, like, lineups for, like, eight rows. So I'm not sure what they're going for here. If they're, like, if it's going to be, like, you only go, like, two at a time. Like, it's to go through the ride. Or, like, if there is supposed to be a whole train and the artist who did this forgot to add the other cars. It, it's really weird. But uh, either way, great addition. I'm, I'm really excited to see what they do with this. I can't wait to see the finished product. Okay, uh, back to our regularly scheduled programming. But the question is, what do we do with the rest of the Antarctica building? As I said earlier, all of the animal exhibits will be removed from this version of SeaWorld. And that includes the penguin pen that currently sits here. And with a theme like Antarctica, it's only fitting we do another indoor attraction. Now, even though a dark ride originally sat here and failed to last more than 10 years, that doesn't mean we can't try again. So I thought, let's do a dark ride again, but take a very different approach to it this time. This idea is called March of the Penguins. Unlike the previous attraction here, this will be an Omnimover attraction, similar to the Haunted Mansion or Secret Life of Pets Off the Leash. In this ride, you march with the penguins across the snowy landscapes of Antarctica before making it to a beautiful ice cave that glows different colors. Inside, penguins laugh and dance and play with walruses. I want this to be very reminiscent of a dark ride you would see in a park like Efteling, with riders passing beautiful dioramas and awe-inspiring visuals. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, I pretty much got the idea for this ride from Happy Feet. I mean, like, hey, you gotta admit, a great movie also makes for a great ride, am I right? Oh, brother, this guy stinks! The building will probably need to be extended a bit to fit this attraction, but at the same time, this ride doesn't need to be too long to get the point across. Overall, this is another great dark ride to add to a new, revitalized Antarctica section. Before we continue to our next new land, let's make a quick stop at the central land of the park, the waterfront. This area is currently the hub for dining in the park, with the Flamecraft bar always full of parents drinking their asses off while their kids ride every coaster in the park. Oh, I guess I better sit down. On top of that, you got incredible dining locations in the Voyager Smokehouse and the Lakeside Grill. This area also contains one ride, a Sky Tower which for some bizarre reason is an upcharge attraction. Now words cannot express how unbelievably stupid it is to have your one non-roller coaster attraction, other than Infinity Falls, that isn't in Sesame Street Land be an upcharge. Especially when it's just a sky tower of all things. So it should come as no surprise that in this version of SeaWorld, the upcharge is being removed from that ride. 
end a story. Outside of this, there is one major addition that will be coming to this area, and it will be added in the currently empty Seaport Theater. Now back in the day, SeaWorld used to host a show in the Nautilus Theater called Allure, an acrobatic show similar in style to a show you would see from Cirque du Soleil. It's a shame that the park has yet to receive a new show that lives up to what this show was. So with this empty theater here, I thought why not bring back that Cirque style show but with a twist. Now Las Vegas is known for having a handful of Cirque du Soleil shows taking residency over there. And one of those shows is called O, a show that features a massive pool in the middle which is incorporated into the acrobatics of the show. I think it would be really cool if SeaWorld had a show very similar to this. Oh, squared if you want to call it. If the theater is reconfigured to a theater of the round style setup, it could accommodate a show like this very well. This is the first of a couple shows I will be introducing to fill up the gap left by all the shows being torn out, and later I will be going over all the other new shows that I will be adding. But before that, let's go to our next new land of the park. So at SeaWorld Abu Dhabi, they have this incredible area of the park called Micro Ocean. This indoor land features massive neon reefs and rides that interact with the area around it. I wanted to bring an area like this to the park, and with the Sea Lion Theater no longer being a thing, that leaves a big chunk of land to put in a massive show building for something like this. So this new land is called Neon Reef, an indoor land that glows in every color of the rainbow and has the added bonus of being both air conditioned and immune to the bipolar weather conditions of Florida. Within this land will be four attractions. The big attraction of this land will be an intimate hot racer called Electric Eel. Now I was bouncing between an RMC Raptor and an intimate hot racer for this idea. But ultimately, I went with the Hot Racer, since when it comes to launches, we all know RMC doesn't have the greatest history with those. <laughs> By being launched, it'll be a lot easier to fit this coaster within a large show building. This coaster will bob and weave through all the glowing reefs around the land, and also wrap around some of the other attractions within. To make this a little different for Project Toboggan, this ride will feature two inversions, making this a step up from the more family-oriented coasters without being as intense as the high-octane coasters in the park. In the Thrill tier list, I'd put this on the same level as like Icebreaker or Pipeline. Speaking of the other attractions in this land, we got Jellyfish Swirl, a wave swinger where you ride on the tentacles of a giant jellyfish. This would be very similar to the ride of the same name in SeaWorld San Diego, except indoor and more visually appealing. Also in this area will be Coral Cartwheel, a Zampera Nebulas. These rides have become very popular in the theme park realm, and for obvious reason. I mean, look at how cool these things look. This will be an absolute people eater along with the last attraction in this land, Neon Trek. This is one of those rope courses that you see popping up everywhere, but unlike those rope courses, this one comes with an awesome neon aesthetic. This will crawl around the whole land, with parts going over some of the flat rides in the land, and the electric eel coaster will wrap around parts of the course as well. From the cool neon aesthetics of Neon Reef, we move back outside for the next land on our tour. So in terms of what is currently in this land, Mako and Infinity Falls will remain pretty much untouched as they already suit the direction I'm going in with this land. The rest of the land though, let's talk about it. So starting over where Shark Wreck Reef currently stands, I wanted to bring in a new dining experience to the park, something on the level of the sci-fi dine-in theater at Disney's Hollywood Studios. And in researching for this video, I came across a dining experience at Europa Park in Germany called Eat Adrenalin. Eat Adrenalin. What a what what a name. Now this is a fine dining experience where you ride in moving seats from room to room, where each room has a unique theme and food to go along with it. Now I want to focus on one of the first rooms that you enter in this dining experience which places guests in an underwater looking room that slowly turns into a cove where you watch the sunset. Now, I saw this and was gobsmacked at how cool it looked. And then it hit me, what if this room was built to accommodate more guests 
and there was more visual transformations to this one room. And then that's when the idea for Seven Plates Lagoon came to me. Essentially, the dining experience here would all take place within this big room. We'd go from underwater, to a cove on the beach, to a tropical jungle, even a storm here and there. This could become the new go-to dining experience for guests visiting the park. Unless, of course, they want to get shit-faced at the Flamecraft bar. <laughs> Down the road, we got the former Nautilus Theater. This theater has been standing here abandoned since the park reopened after that fun year that was 2020, and since then this area has been prime real estate for a new attraction. Now, I have always been a fan of simulator attractions, with rides like Star Tours and Back to the Future being rides I hold close to the heart. SeaWorld actually used to have a simulator attraction called Wild Arctic, but really they should have called it Mid Arctic because damn that ride was lame. Like what, it's like you ride through a mountain for two minutes and that's it? Like, come on guys, what, what are we doing here? But before that, there was another simulator ride, and this is a ride I want to revive for this new land. And that ride is called Mission Bermuda Triangle. So just like before, I want to use the cabin style simulator that you can find on Star Tours or Body Wars. But unlike the original traction, this will last a lot longer than two minutes. Riders enter a submarine to explore the Bermuda Triangle and are attacked by a flurry of sea creatures including a megalodon, a giant squid, and near the end, even a leviathan. Now SeaWorld has proven that they can make exciting submarine themed simulators. I mean look at like the footage from Kraken's VR experience for example. So imagine that, but as a full fledged simulator, that would be incredible. But if we're talking major e-ticket attractions for this area, look no further than the final addition to this land, Vortex. So there is this big pond in the middle of the land, and I'm sure we've all thought of what it would be like for a roller coaster to interact with this thing. Now there are many coasters that could work here, from a B&M invert to an SNS 40 free spin, but I wanted to put something truly memorable in this spot. So to explain my idea, I want to first direct your attention to a coaster located in Japan called Diving Coaster Vanish. Now this coaster is not very special at all, except for one moment where the coaster literally dives into the water. As a kid, seeing this made me a coaster enthusiast, and I only hope that one day something like this can hit America. So seeing this pond here gave me a great idea. How about we do Diving Coaster Vanish, but instead of whatever that is, what we do is we make it a Vekoma Tilt Coaster. So the ride starts off in this abandoned building where the coaster rises and then hangs you over a raging electrified whirlpool. The coaster then tilts you forward before dropping you down under the water. You then shoot out by the entrance to Mission Bermuda Triangle, hitting an Immelman, and then racing back along the water's edge. Afterward, you go through a little twister section before finally engaging the brake run. If this coaster does one thing right, it will be a visual masterpiece. That kind of coaster that makes you go, HOLY, Holy crap! CRAP! But for those who find this too intimidating, not too far away is another coaster that I think will be much more enjoyable for the whole family. And now for a word from our sponsors. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm not sponsored. Unfortunately, I'm too new for that. Oh well, let's continue. Now we reach the spot of the former Orca Stadium. And I don't need to tell y'all the dark history of this stadium and the incidents that happened here. I do need to tell you about the things I want to do with this area. Starting along the water's edge, we got a roller coaster water ride hybrid that feels way too obvious for this park. But how can I not resist adding a mock power splash here? This is Orca Power Splash with killer whale colored cars and a turntable station for added capacity. I think visually this is a great spot for this attraction, with the rest of the park serving as a backdrop for it. You can also get some insane views of this attraction from the paddle boats that share the same water as this attraction. 
Across the way, the former Dineless Shamu Pool will be converted and a new theater built for a high diving show called Reach for the Sky. I've always found high diving really cool, and it surprises me that a theme park based around water would rather showcase animal cruelty over feats of endurance and bravery. This will be a must watch for all park goers. For those wondering if this means we are losing a restaurant for this, no. In fact, a new restaurant will be built called Pearl of the Sea. This will be very similar to the giraffe bar at Busch Gardens Tampa. You know, two levels, big upstairs patio, gives great views of the park. It will be a nice new dining location to add to all the other great dining locations out there. And finally, taking up a big chunk of the area left over by the Orca Stadium is not a ride, not a show, but instead, a botanical garden. What's smooth? A botanical garden? Why would you put a botanical garden in the park? So one thing that I think parks need is a quiet area where you can get away from the hustle and bustle and just enjoy your surroundings. Parks like Bush Gardens and Islands of Adventure do this very well. I thought it would be cool to feature a botanical garden with fountains and floral arrangements that represent different marine life and organisms with multiple different paths you can get lost in, and many hidden secrets within, this will offer a nice alternate experience to the usual thrilling affairs of the park. Before we get to our last area, I wanted to make a quick stop at Sesame Street Land. And I gotta be honest, this is the laziest land I have ever seen at a theme park. And before you start screaming at me for how ridiculous of a claim this is, Bear in mind, we are in an ocean-themed amusement park, and we got a land not even remotely themed to the ocean. Like, if they wanted to just have a straight-up Sesame Street park, why didn't they just build one across the street and charge a separate admission for it? I mean, they got a Sesame Street park in Pennsylvania, and that park does gangbusters over there. At least at Bush Gardens down the street, they put some effort in giving their Sesame Street land a jungle theme. So as easy as it would be to move Sesame Street out of the park, I thought it would be better to actually keep Sesame Street but give it an ocean twist. So with that we got Sesame Street Happy Harbor. Pretty much everything in the land will be reskinned to have that ocean theme to it, including retheming the buildings to make the area look like an oceanside town, rather than the streets of New York. Most importantly will be the addition of two new attractions. First, we got the Happy Harbor Playhouse, a small theater housing a stage show starring all of your favorite Sesame Street characters in a fun musical adventure with dancing and bubbles. Lots and lots of bubbles. And on the other side of the land, we got a brand new attraction, the final dark ride I'm adding to this park, Reef Sweepers. This will be a submarine dark ride similar to what you would find at the Legoland parks. Throughout the ride, you'll see the Sesame Street characters swimming through a reef cleaning it up for all the real fish that you see swimming around your vehicle. It ends on a colorful reef where everyone is seen swimming happily. I feel this ride is a great chance to teach kids about the importance of keeping our waters and reefs clean of garbage and other toxins. And hey, maybe we can even get some rich CEOs from those oil companies to come ride this. Maybe they can learn a thing or two from this ride. But what this ride won't teach you is how to prepare yourself for the final land of this reimagined sea world. Finally, we got Extreme Pier, a land dedicated to action sports and the crazy relationship humans have with water. Now with the recent opening of Pipeline the Surf Coaster, I feel this area is starting to head in this extreme sport direction. And I wanted to continue that theme. First thing I want to focus on is Reef Theming Icebreaker. Now let's be real here, this coaster being themed to ice makes zero sense. I don't care if you got the remains of Wild Arctic across the street, if it ain't in Antarctica, it shouldn't be themed to ice. And seeing it's located along the water, and how the ride focuses on quick pops of airtime, it almost makes you wonder why they didn't just theme it to power boating in the first place. So let's fix that. With a new coat of white and blue paint and a more powerboat looking ride vehicle, let's retheme this ride to Wave Breaker. Just next door, we got another new thrilling flat ride. 
lead to paragliding along the beach, which I call Max Altitude. This will be another new favorite in the theme park community, a Zamperla Endeavor. This is the spiritual successor to the Enterprise, and man it looks cool. I would use the two across seating variant for capacity's sake, and have it tilt towards the water to plus those visuals. On the other side of the pond near Pipeline, we got Jet Ski Swirl, a jet ski carousel built by Zero. These are very popular, especially at the Legoland theme parks. It is another one of those rides that are so obvious for this park, it's confusing how they haven't put one in yet. This is a very unique flat ride that also serves as a water ride, and is one that every member of the family can enjoy. The Bayside Stadium will host the new Action Zone Stunt Spectacular, a stunt show featuring jet skiers, BMX riders, paragliders, and even a pirate or two. This will give the stadium some action throughout the year, whenever you don't got Neo or the Beach Boys hogging up the joint. And finally, I saved the best attraction for last. Now, Wild Arctic currently holds up this massive chunk of land, and only holds an abandoned simulator attraction, the most depressing aquatic display I've ever seen in my life. With this all torn out, plus some of the parking lot behind it, you got space for a massive new roller coaster. Something that could be a world beater in the American coaster world. And after much debate, I thought to go for a coaster type that's so out there, so mind bending, that people will scream holy crap just looking at it. And of course I'm referring to none other than a Zamperla lift and launch. Nah, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's an SNS 4th Dimension coaster, and more specifically, I want to clone Ejanaika and slap it in this park. But smooth, I hear you ask, aren't those coasters a dead model? We haven't seen one built in years. Those are way too expensive to build. Why would SeaWorld Orlando of all parks be the place to build one of those? Shouldn't they build one in Cedar Point instead? This is so stupid. Well, this is why I think a fourth dimension coaster actually makes a lot more sense at this park specifically more than any other park in the US. SeaWorld Orlando has kind of built a reputation for building off-kilter coasters that actually kind of slap. I mean, look at their two most recent additions, Pipeline and Icebreaker. These are great examples of this. So having a coaster with seats that spin opposite to what the track is doing would be extremely fitting for this park. With this being a clone of another coaster being built by an American manufacturer, it'll significantly drop the cost the park would usually put towards research and development, plus shipping of the parts since it's all domestic. Remember, X2 might have been more expensive than Ejanaika, but the amount of research and development they had to put in to get that ride to work was insurmountable considering X2 was a prototype and Ejanaika was essentially an import. With X2 being so far away from Florida, a lot of park goers in this region of the US have never seen a coaster like this, meaning that for a lot of local park goers, this is gonna be their new bucket list coaster. Way over Iron Gwazi, way over Velocicoaster, heck, even over the earlier mentioned Tidal Twister. How many of you would actually complain if a copy of Ejanaika came over to the States? At least now you won't have to blow thousands of dollars in order to experience it. Now you can come to Orlando and blow those thousands of dollars on Mickey Mouse merch. To fit in with the land, this ride will be called Rampage and be themed to a hurricane blowing through a coastal town. Now I'm sure the reps at Publix are going to start blasting me for how insensitive a theme like this probably will be. And hey, I, I get it, alright? I recently visited my childhood town of Fort Myers after it was hit by Hurricane Ian in 2022. 
and seeing what happened there really sucked. But I mean, how do you not theme this coaster to a hurricane? Like, it fits it perfectly. Imagine dropping down the first drop into a beach house and blasting out of the roof before doing a backflip nearly 200 feet in the air before twirling past a ton of wreckage till you hit the end. And like Ejinica, I want to go with the five car trains. This may hurt the capacity of the ride, but at least the ride will retain its insane speed and intensity. China has a six car variant of this coaster called Dinoconda, and you can notice in the videos of it how much slower it is in comparison to Ejinica. With this insane coaster and everything else mentioned before, I present to you all my ideal build out for SeaWorld Orlando. So to recap, I've added 6 new coasters, 5 new flat rides, 3 new dark rides, a simulator attraction, 2 new water rides, 2 interactive experiences, 4 new shows, 2 new restaurants, and a new mode of transportation, all without replacing any of the current rides and attractions within the park that aren't already closed or abandoned. As well, each land now has a defined theme and identity. Do I see a lot of these ideas coming to fruition? No, of course not. But it's always fun to present ideas for a park and hope some of them see the light of day. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, then feel free to hit the like and subscribe button. I hope to bring you all more videos like this in the future. And if you have a park that you want to see me reimagine, type it in the comments below and I'll get to work reimagining it. Until then, thank you for making it to the end of my video. And I wish you all nothing but smooth travels. Take it easy, y'all. So, uh, you think that Mako coaster is pretty good, right, bro? He's saying yes.